This video will be an um, introduction and tutorial to high performance liquid chromatography. In this case, we'll be utilizing the Waters Breeze system. So this is going to be a compendium of an HPLC instrument coupled with a computer workstation which we'll be using for control of the instrument itself. So let's first take a quick tour of the instrument. Now as I mentioned, high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC is a separation technique for um, samples and complex mixtures in the liquid phase. So we're going to start over here with what we call the mobile phase. The mobile phase of course is going to the, be the liquid carrier that pushes our sample through the instrument. In this case, the mobile phase is going to be a simple 50% by volume mixture of methyl alcohol and water. As you can see here, we have a sipper or a tube that leads from the mobile phase reservoir down to a pumping system. Alright, so if we stand back from this a bit, we see that the instrument actually has dual pumping systems. We have pump A on the bottom and pump B on top. Now since we're just going to be utilizing a single uh, mobile phase, we're going to be using just pump A here on the bottom. Alright, so that takes care of the pumping system. Now, from the pumping system, we can actually move the mobile phase over to the injector region. So we have an, eject an injector here, it's the Water 717 Plus Auto Sampler, so this serves as the injector. And of course what we have here is a carousel system. So what I can do is load my sample, in this case just a caffeine sa um, standard, into um, the carousel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the carousel here so that I can place the vial in carousel position number one. And you can see that it's there. So if you were to actually have a sample of a beverage that you wanted to test, that would be placed into position number two right next to the standard. Okay, so we can now place the standard back into the carousel and close the door on the auto sampler. And now the carousel will turn and align itself to the proper position. So we're going to let that happen. Now inside of the um, auto sampler, we're going to see the actual injection region. So this is where some of the sample of the standard can be drawn up into a um, low volume um, sampling loop which can then be placed um, as a plug into the um, path of the mobile phase. At this point that plug then is introduced to the column which you can see right here. Now the column of course is where the separation itself of a complex mixture would be taking place based upon interactions between the analyte and either the mobile phase or the stationary phase. So a separation occurs there. And of course, once the separation occurs, we have to be able to detect the components coming off of the column. So in that situation, we're going to be using the water's dual wavelength absorbance detector. And this is really nothing more than a simple spectrophotometer. Um, it has inside of it a deuterium um, source because we're going to be primarily working in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum because that's where most organic compounds will absorb. So what we have inside of this is going to be a small volume um, quartz flow cell through which the uh, mobile phase and the various components of the mixture can pass. And of course, obliquely to that, light can pass and allow us to then determine absorbances of each component as it moves through um, the small sampling region. And then of course down at the bottom we have a waste reservoir. So everything that comes through the column in the system is collected in the waste reservoir. Now to start the experiment, we will have turned on each component of the instrumentation. So the auto sampler will have been turned on, the detector will have been turned on, and set to the analytical wavelength of 254 nanometers. That wavelength is chosen because that's the wavelength at which caffeine absorbs um, to a large degree. So to get started, what we're going to do is to come over to the software and we're going to find the breeze icon, which we see here, and we're going to double click on the breeze icon to establish connection and communication between the instrument and the software. 
And what you'll see here is that we have to scan for the various um, instrument components here. And then once that's happened, we can set parameters and we are ready to go. All right, so it looks like at this point the instrument um, has handshaken with the computer, software is operational, and we are ready to get started. So before we do anything else, the very first thing that we have to think about is purging the system. So we want to make sure that the system has no air in it, the system has no um, residual analyte or anything of that nature in it, and the only thing that's passing through the system before we actually introduce the new analyte is pure mobile phase. So we're going to start by choosing the correct icon here. Now one nice thing about the icons here is you can hover over them and it actually tells you what the icon does. So this funny looking one down here as I hover over it tells me that that's what I'm going to press to purge the pump, injector, and detector. So let's hit that icon. So now it takes us through um, essentially a wizard. So we want to um, purge both the um, pumps and the injector here. So we're going to go ahead and say next. And now it's going to tell us exactly what to do. So the assumption is that the instrument has not been run for a while. So the first thing that we have to do is actually prime the pump. So what this means is that we have to draw liquid into the pump chamber itself before we start the pump. So to do this, we are going to go ahead and um, open up the draw valve. Okay, so we're going to come back around here. And this valve right here is going to be turned to the right. And we're going to leave it in that position because that's essentially a bypass valve here. And we'll come back and we'll close that again when we need to after we have actually um, purged the pumps. All right, but for now, that puts us into a bypass position. So we'll come back here and we'll hit next. Now at this point, we don't want to engage pump B because if we do that, pump B will just pump air into the system. So we're going to disable pump B and engage only pump A. Now we've already taken care of the bypass valve that's already been pushed to the bypass position. We're going to leave the flow rate on pump A at 5 milliliters um, per minute. And I'm going to hit next. Now what's going to happen here is now pump A will begin to pump. So you can see what we really have here are two reciprocating pumps where one pump is stroking out as the other pump is stroking in. And the reason why we have this is so that where there are no variations in the flow rate or pulsations in the flow rate, this will give us a nice even flow rate. Now in this case, I didn't actually prime the pump because I felt like I had just used the instrument recently, but if we were to have primed the pump, I will show you how to do that. Um, I can come back and swing back to that. And what we're looking for is a nice constant flow of liquid coming out of the bypass valve here. So we see that we have a nice constant flow. If I see any intermittent um, liquid here, what that is going to tell me is that I've got air in the system. In this case, I do not have air in the system. All right, so after that's happened to a certain degree, I'm going to come back and tell it that I want to stop purging the pump. At this point, I can be satisfied that the pump chamber itself um, is full of mobile phase and there are no bubbles. Okay, and you can actually see the um, pump pressure coming back down. I'm going to go ahead and hit next at this point. And now what we want to do is close the reference valve. So in this case, I want to go back to placing the flow coming from the pump away from the bypass and back into the direction of the injector. Because the next thing that we're going to do is purge the injector. So that lever is um, placed tightly to the left. Okay, so we've done that. So now I can come back to next. And again, I want to disable pump B because I don't want to force air into the system. So I'm going to bring the flow rate of pump B down to zero. I'm going to leave the flow rate of pump A at one milliliter per minute, which is appropriate for um, purging the injector. Okay, so I'm going to hit next. And now we're going to go through a purging of the injector itself. 
So what we're trying to do here is to push mobile phase into the injector in order to eliminate, and again, any air that may be there, and also to push out any residual analyte that may be there. So at this point, the pump is ramping up slowly to eventually get to one milliliter per minute. And coming back here, you can actually see the flow rate slowly moving up um, as we um, get closer to the one milliliter per minute. So that's intentionally brought up slowly so that we don't generate too much back pressure on the system now that the system is fully engaged. So we're moving that mobile phase flow rate up to the target uh, value of one milliliter per minute. And normally speaking, this purging would take about 10 minutes. So if I weren't doing this as a demo and you were actually doing this as a lab experiment, you would let the purge occur for the full 10 minutes or until the instrument has actually um, fully undergone that purge. It may take less than 10 minutes, at which point um, you will be notified um, by the software. So we'll let this go for a few moments. And then, for the sake of expediency, I am actually going to stop the purge. Looks like it's actually um, doing that on its own. We can actually see the um, pump flow rate coming down. So it didn't require, in this case, the full 10 minutes um, to do the purge. So we're going to actually let the um, pump flow rate come back to zero. And then we can um, move on. So as the pump ramped up slowly, the pump also ramps down slowly, again, so we don't generate any back pressure in the system. All right, so it looks like we're finished here, so I'm going to go ahead and tell the wizard to finish out. All right, so at this point, the next thing that we would want to do is we'd want to establish a baseline. So in other words, we want to make sure that the um, absorbance is not changing as a function of time. Because what might happen, for example, is there could be residual material on the column that we need to push through that could cause the absorbance to change. So in other words, we would like to have a flat absorbance versus time baseline. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back into the monitor baseline mode. So this little icon down here at the bottom tells you here is to equilibrate the system and monitor the baseline. So we're going to hit that. Um, we're going to go into um, the test method, which is just our um, caffeine method, which is just going to push our mobile phase through at a fixed um, flow rate of one milliliter per minute. So we'll just hit equilibrate here. And now what we're going to do is we're going to watch this little window down here. So as the system starts up and we begin to um, push mobile phase um, through the system, we're actually going to start to see the detector respond to that. Okay, so we go to a single window here. And what we're going to see happen now, and we can probably start to see it at this point, is you're going to see the um, red line here corresponding to the measured absorbance. Now it's not unusual to have some fluctuation here, and what we don't want to see is large fluctuations, because large fluctuations would indicate that we have some sort of impurity on the column or in the um, detector that needs to be washed out. At this point, notice that the absorbance units are very, very small. Okay, so there is a little bit of fluctuation, but again, notice um, what the units or what the numbers on that y-axis look like. Those are very, very tiny changes in absorbance that we're seeing. Now again, normally what I would do is let this run out for a full 10 to 20 minutes to be absolutely certain that we have no major fluctuations in that baseline. So once we've established that the baseline is essentially um, steady, then we can prepare for an injection. Okay, so I'm just going to get this go a little bit longer just to make sure there's nothing left on the column. Again, we see some fluctuation here, but these absorbances are quite small. A 
because sometimes if we do see fluctuations that move back and forth through here, sometimes those fluctuations may actually be um, indicative of air bubbles moving through the system. So what we see there is that could very well be a tiny air bubble that's moving through the system at this point. But it looks like things are going to calm down here. As I said, normally I would um, let this run out for a full 10 minutes until we see a nice steady baseline. But again, for the sake of expediency here, what I want to do is a single injection so that we can see what a single injection actually looks like. So we'll let this guy come back down close to baseline, this bubble or whatever happens to be moving through the system here. And I'm gonna call that good enough. So now we're ready to make a single injection. So what we're going to do is set the auto sampler up to do that. So this little icon over here that looks like a key, that's what we're going to use to make a single injection using the auto sampler. Okay, so once I do that, I'm stating that I have a caffeine standard here. It's going to be injecting that standard. We're gonna be using the same test method that we're running right now, which is indicative of that one milliliter per minute flow rate. We're gonna be sampling out of vial one, which is the vial in position one that I placed in the carousel. Our injection volume is set at five microliters, and I'm gonna set up a run time for 10 minutes here. Okay, so what we're gonna do is go ahead and tell it to make this injection. Now, the message says here that we're going to wait while we exit the baseline monitor mode. So this takes just a moment or two, but once we um, exit that mode, then we're going to actually see the injection take place. And we're going to know that it's taking place because we're going to hear the auto sampler start to work. So we can actually move over to the auto sampler at this point. Okay, so it says it's idle, it's still waiting for instructions to come forward, and here they come. So again, the computer and the software are controlling the um, auto sampler and the injection at this point. So notice that we're um, injecting from vial 1 and our um, injection volume is going to be 5 microliters. So at this point we're in the pre-injection operation, meaning essentially that we are rinsing the injector and the sample loop at this point with um, the caffeine standard that we're going to be injecting onto the column. So you can actually hear the liquid being drawn up into the um, sample loop um, and then being rinsed out um, using a needle injector that's being dropped down into that vial. Okay, so we're now in the operation of analysis, which means that the injection has been made. So the sample loop has been loaded, and now the sample loop has been made available um, to the um, flow of the mobile phase. So the um, Caffeine sample or standard has now been introduced onto the column as a plug. So it's now moving through the column where if there are multiple components, um, we will actually be seeing each component come off of the um, column individually. Now in this case, since this is a standard, there should really only be one component and that one component is gonna be caffeine. So we can come back to the uh, monitor here and we can watch the chromatogram develop. And by the way, the chromatograph is the name of the instrument and the chromatogram is the absorbance versus time plot that we get from the instrument. So again, what we ought to see happening here is a peak come out and that peak will correspond to the um, caffeine. So we'll be able to determine from the chromatogram the retention time for the caffeine. So we'll watch this for a couple minutes and see if and when the caffeine does come out. Okay, so, so far not much is happening. So what that means is that the caffeine is still in the column, it's still being pushed through the column, and it's not yet gotten to the um, detector. Okay, so it looks like maybe a little pre-peak here. Sometimes we see that, that little pre-peak there might correspond to a little air bubble um, that came in with the injection. So usually air is the first thing that gets in, it's also the first thing that passes through the column because it's not retained on the column. So that's fairly typical to see. That's probably a little air peak there. So we're at two minutes and we'll see whether or not caffeine decides to come out or not. And 
And again, if you look at those absorbance fluctuations, they're actually very, very small. So at this point, we can really say that nothing of interest has passed through the column. So if and when the caffeine hits, we expect to see a large inflection in the absorbance there. Okay, so something's happening here. Let's see what it is. So notice how large that peak is becoming. And it looks like it came out just past um, two minutes here. So this looks like it may well be our caffeine peak coming out right now. Okay, at some point the peak will roll over, which it looks like it's done. And now it's coming back down the other side. So it looks like we're getting a very nicely resolved caffeine peak here. So I have this set to actually run for a full 10 minutes. So eventually we would see that peak hopefully come back down to baseline and then um, resolve itself back to baseline and um, ensure now that all of the caffeine has been rinsed out of the column and through the detector. So again, we're getting very close to our baseline value at this point. All right, so this is more or less what the caffeine peak is going to look like. Now, while this develops, the next thing that you're gonna do once that we've shown that we can get a nice peak and verify a retention time on it, is we need to set up what's called a sample set. So the instructions in the um, handout and also in the manual, which is always here next to the instrument, will together show you how to generate that sample set. Now what the sample set will do is to run a series of standards for you. So what we're going to do is use that same um, standard of caffeine that I just showed you that we just loaded into the instrument, but we're going to inject several different volumes of that. And by doing that, we're injecting different masses of caffeine onto the column. And since a larger volume corresponds to a larger mass or amount of caffeine, we can actually end up generating a standard curve using those data. So the sample set will allow you to um, do that automatically. So it essentially um, tells the instrument um, exactly what injections are going to be made, what volumes are going to be injected, and then we're going to see a chromatogram develop for each one. So then once all of those standards have been run, and then finally at the end of it, you will also um, inject your um, unknown, whatever that may be. And um, from there, what we can actually do is generate a standard curve. Now the other thing that you have to be able to do at the end of all of this is to analyze the data that you have in your sample set. So let's see if I can actually do that while this is running. So to do that, you're gonna come up and you're going to do find data. So let's see if it actually lets us out of this mode to do that, and it does. So if I go to injection tab on this, okay, that's going to give us timestamp data of all the different um, data that we've got there. So for example, I can see a series of caffeine standards that I ran just to test the instrument, and then underneath that, you'll notice the results of a sample set that were run last fall. So it looks like I've got one, two, three, four, five standards and an unknown. And all of those are date and time stamped, so you can see exactly what you're dealing with. So when you get to that point, you will end up with a date and time stamped um, sample set that you can then um, access in this way. Now to generate the standard curve, we need to be able to determine the area under the caffeine peak. So I'm gonna go up here to this caffeine standard here um, that I ran, it looks like yesterday, okay? And I'm gonna double click on that with a left mouse click, okay? Now I'm gonna come in and, and click on that again, and that shows me the actual chromatogram that I got, okay? So this is a chromatogram that I ran yesterday off caffeine. Now I want to determine the um, area under the peak. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hover over this icon up here that has the little blue drop on it. And that should tell me that it's the integrate icon. I'm gonna press that once. 
Now notice down here that you have these little triangles. These little triangles can be moved around to establish the baseline. So if I wanted to actually move that one there, I could do it to establish a baseline. In this case, the 2.996 that I see here corresponds to the retention time of this peak. Okay. Now, if we look down here, what we're going to see is that the instrument is picking up two peaks. It looks like it sees a very small peak at 1.565 minutes, which probably corresponds to that air peak that we mentioned before. And then the big peak at 2.996 minutes, which is probably our caffeine peak. Now, since I've set my baseline, it's peak number two that corresponds to the 2.996 that I want. And now we're automatically getting an integrated area, which is what I'm pointing at here. And that's going to be in units of microvolts times seconds, okay? So that's the number that I'm pointing to that you would want to write down for your particular standard um, that will become a data point on your standard curve. So again, with your standard curve, what you're plotting is the integrated area versus the micrograms of caffeine injected, which of course you can go back and calculate. All right, so that should take care of everything that we need to know. Um, we can get rid of this. And then we can also just go back here and see how we're doing. So it looks like our original injection that we made is coming out quite nicely. So what will happen is once this hits the 10-minute um, mark, and we can actually wait for it, it will actually provide this as a nice um, sample for us. Um, right here on the screen so we can more or less see exactly what we need to see. So I probably let this go out a little longer than I needed to, but I really did want to make sure that I was generating a nice baseline on the tail end of this peak. So again, we'll wait just a moment so you can see what the final output of this is going to look like. So ultimately, it's going to show us the data. So we'll wait for that for a moment. We're almost there. But again, it looks like a very nicely resolved peak. The fact that there's just a single peak that we see here tells me that there's really only one main component um, in this um, sample. So if you think about it, this was um, a standard that I made up of dissolved caffeine, I believe, in methanol. So in this case, you're really only going to see the caffeine as the one single component. Now when you do your beverage of choice, whether it's Coke, tea, kombucha, whatever it is that you run, you would expect to see multiple peaks now in the chromatogram because when you think about those things, there are lots of different components because those drinks correspond to complex mixtures of sugars, tea components, caffeine, um, other things like that. Okay, so it looks like we're almost finished here. So um, this will probably end up showing us, there it is, a nice little um, graphical representation of the chromatogram and it ends up giving us things like the um, retention time and what have you. And again, I could go back and find this under the find data if I wanted to and get an integrated peak area underneath if I wish to actually use this for the standard curve. All right, I think that's everything you basically need to know about this instrument.